Open your Bibles if you have them. I hope you do. I mean, it's like I, I remember the, my uh, uh, calculus teacher said, if you, if you come to class without a calculator, it's like going to the battlefield without a gun. If you come into math class, bring a calculator. Well, if you come into church, you, you bring a Bible. Just bring one. Just bring it, whether it's on your phone or if you're old school like me, you just got to have the pages. Bring your Bible. We're, we're in, on Sunday mornings, we're going to be in the Word. It's going to be a, a rich time of in the Word. And this morning, we're continuing what we begun last week. And if you didn't have a chance, um, Wes Hall touched on this theme of what do you do in the hour of trouble, hour of the crisis, when you're, when you're in that prison or wilderness season. He gave us five principles that we could apply to our lives in that season. And to get used to the fact that the Lord brings us, he's the one that creates the wilderness season. He leads you out of Egypt, brings you into the wilderness. You know, sometimes the Lord puts you in prison. You know, and, that, and so his message was powerful on Friday night. I want to encourage you, if you didn't have a chance to listen to it, you can go to Open Door, um, Open Door House of Prayer YouTube channel. I think that's where it's at. And it may be, do you have it on one of your channels, Wes, or is that where? It's on the Reach Facebook page. The Reach Facebook page. Okay. But I encourage you to do that. Um, go ahead and open your Bibles to John chapter 15. I want to talk to us about the next two weeks on how to cooperate during a season of pruning and discipline. How many of you know there are different seasons in the Christian life? And some seasons are more easily embraced than others. And you don't always know you're going into a different season until you find yourself in one. And and I would submit to you that the entire body is in a season of pruning and of discipline globally. It's not just us. The Lord is preparing for His coming. And He's making us ready. And judgment begins in the house of God. And so, therefore, he's visiting us with his refiner's fire. You know, today, there's a lot of different things we mean when we ask for the fire of God to come. And and one of them is his purifying, sanctifying power. How many of you know how powerful the fire of the Holy Spirit is? You know how intense fire is? I think I realized how intense fire is when I saw 9-11. You're up 90 floors, 1,000 feet, and you have two choices. I can try to run through that fire, or I can jump. And if anybody, as horrible as that footage was, it left an indelible mark in my mind. People would look into the fire, and then they would look 1,000 feet down. They would look into the fire. And they would choose to jump. One of the actions, one of the, one of the uh, uh, ministries of the Holy Spirit is to come like a refiner's fire to cause, so to speak, that old man to jump. To burn up every vestige, every hindrance to love. It's the jealousy of the Lord to remove everything that hinders in our relationship with Him. He comes with those eyes like a flame of fire, the very sword of the Lord, the fire of the Holy Spirit to refine us and purify us. And nobody enters that season pretty. How how many of you know that? You don't go, he's coming with the fire. It's going to be a great season. No, the fire comes and it usually comes quickly and you find yourself in that sanctifying season where the Lord is beginning to work. And last week, we spoke about the anointing of the Holy Spirit in the ministry of Jesus, where Jesus' ministry gives us a pattern how God operates, that the anointing to birth a move of God is not the anointing that carries the move of God. And so Jesus comes, and he's the only leader I know that killed the movement before he rebirthed the movement. We want God to come and give us glory, 
to glory, hallelujah, more glory, more Lord, more and more. And the Lord comes to give us crucifixion and resurrection. Glory to glory is on the inside. Your inner man is going glory to glory to glory while your outward man is being crucified. And that's just the ways of the Lord. And if somebody doesn't tell you that at the front end, you you won't get the ways of the Lord. It's like Abraham, go to a land that I've shown you and I will give you this land as an inheritance for your descendants and their descendants and they will be as numerous as the stars is in the sky. And Abraham says, Abram at that point says, yes, and he goes. And the moment he goes, within a few months, or we don't know how actually long it was, but the very next verse is, and then there was a famine in the land. And Abram had to go to Egypt. You're like, what? What? Wait. You said if he leaves his father's house and he goes to a land, then you're going to bless him. You said nothing about once he gets there, there's a famine and a parenthetical season called Egypt. And when you called him out of Egypt, You didn't describe to them the wilderness season. And so oftentimes, we get uh, uh, shipwrecked in our walk with the Lord because we don't understand his ways and we don't know how to cooperate. And so Jesus has three years of just unchecked, unrivaled prosperity with the disciples. And at the the three-year mark, when he goes to Caesarea Philippi, And he has that spiritual retreat with the disciples. He gives them the tip off. Hey, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. It's the first time he's warned them up to this point. He's going, guys, uh, you've had unprecedented fruitfulness. But there's fault lines that are about to be revealed under the surface. You're going to enter into a new season. And on the night... Before he's crucified at the Last Supper, he begins to prepare them for entering into that new season. He's going to say, you you know, it's going to be a rough 24 hours for you guys. It's going to be a really rough uh, uh, three days. But the truth has been over the last six months, the fault lines in his leaders have been arising. That initial anointing he gave them in Matthew chapter 10 To cast out devils, heal the sick, raise the dead, preach the gospel of the kingdom. Now that anointing of that prosperity, now that anointing is not going to be enough because the fault lines of his leaders are going to emerge. And in one uh, gospel, it says that the leaven of the Pharisees is wrong doctrine. And in another gospel, it says it's hypocrisy. So they don't have the right thoughts about God. And they don't live what they say. And so at that moment, he warns them and goes, Hey, you know know that I'm the Messiah now because of Peter's confession, but you don't know my messianic mission. You don't know my ways because you think it's from glory to glory, dominion to dominion, and I'm going to the cross. And as Jesus is preparing for the cross, his leadership team is manifesting a spirit of murder, a spirit of envy and jealousy. They're arguing over who's the greatest. And and it's amazing that Jesus is so kind, they feel perfectly comfortable about arguing over over who's the greatest in front of him. Can you imagine that? And it's a bitter dispute. And John has a spirit of murder on his life. He wants to commit genocide because he's going to have to walk a half mile around the Samaritan village. Wants to call down fire on them. So all the wheels are falling off of his leadership team. His hands are full. Peter's going to deny him. Thomas isn't going to believe even after he's risen from the dead. The rest are going to go back to their old occupation. John's going to have care of Jesus' mother. And one of them's going to betray him. And so his hands are full with this leadership team of which the movement is going to die. I mean, Jesus is going to be dead. The thing's going to look completely dead. The promises are dead for three days. Only 
to resurrect it on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes in power. And so the the lesson that we talked about last week is that most people settle for the initial anointing that births a movement, and that initial anointing can go 50 years after the blessings already left. Most movements live in the initial anointing that bursts the movement. And when Jesus invites them into the purge, the fire, and kills it, and it looks dead, to where do you cooperate with the Lord to get that second anointing, to get rebirth in the place of unity, scriptural understanding, Being refined and sanctified? Do you wait on the Lord together to get that in humility and contrition and brokenness to get that second anointing that then takes it to where Jesus wants to go? And I've found that most movements live, camp out in the initial anointing and long after that anointing has left, they just ride the fumes. And corporate deadness enters in, and usually the group that's corporate deadness, spiritual gangrene, is moving up your leg, and you're the last one to know it, and you can ride off the fumes for the next 30 years, although it's Ichabod and the glory's departed. But you've got a reputation, you can just keep riding off of it, not knowing there was an invitation for that second anointing to come. Because it's that second anointing that I find that Jesus is concerned with. The first anointing is to expose all your stuff. (laughs) And there's enough healing, deliverance, and power in it that the fumes can keep on going. But you've got to deal with the God whose ways are like this. And so I'm going to read John chapter 15, and then we're going to jump into it for a moment. Jesus is preparing his team for the coming trouble. The last three, three and a half years have been unprecedented success. Jesus called it. He says, you remember in Luke chapter 10, he said, uh, I saw Satan fall like lightning. And I've given you power over the enemy to trample on serpents and scorpions and nothing of the enemy will harm you. There's an open heaven. You've had an open heaven for three and a half years, but now Jesus is preparing them for what the gospel of Luke calls the hour of the power of darkness where Satan will initiate the crucifixion event and all that surrounds it. When the Son of God will be Killed, will be rejected, scourged, spit upon, beaten, and murdered. And Jesus is preparing them for that moment when they will become confused, disillusioned, and many will give up. Jesus had to prepare his team for the coming trouble, but many things would be revealed in the storm of the crucifixion. Now, the verse I'm going to get to is chapter 15, 1 through 8, because Jesus is preparing them for a new season and a new experience in the grace of God. It's called pruning. Up to this point, they have not experienced it. They've experienced prosperity. It says they came before him, and he gave them power over devils and sickness. And they've known that power for three and a half years, but they're about to know another season in in the grace of God. It's called pruning. (laughs) And so, I'm not trying to laugh. It's just, if you've ever been in pruning, you you have to laugh. Because it's horrible. (laughs) John 15, 1 to 8. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, 
As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch, it is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. For by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So, Father, we thank you for your word. We bless you. We magnify you. We ask, Father, that you would send Holy Spirit, the teacher, to teach us. We want to learn from him in the name of Jesus. Amen. So here Jesus is preparing them in chapters 14 through 17 for this coming shaking. And really, as we get into this verse, he's going to bring them into a new season, and he's going to introduce them to a new concept called pruning. There's abiding in him, and a a crucial part of that abiding, in fact, in the same teaching of abiding, he introduces the concept of pruning. But I've heard many uh, teachings on abiding in Jesus, and hardly ever do they put pruning in with it. Just get your devotional life a little better. Draw away with him more consistently. Talk to him. Let him talk to you. Communing. uh, uh, Whatever word you want to use to to, uh, interchange it with abiding. But right in the middle of abiding, he introduces you to the crucial concept of abiding. And it's pruning. There's remaining in the vine. And then he tips you off. If you remain in the vine as a blessing to your remaining, to your abiding, is pruning. We usually don't equate those two things. We don't go abiding equals pruning. (laughs) Abiding is different from pruning. But actually Jesus puts it together and he's going to introduce them at the very beginning of 14 after he's had the the last supper with them and washed their feet and identified that that the shepherd will be struck, the sheep will scatter, Peter will deny him, one will betray him, the rest will run off. Now he's going to prepare them emotionally for this pruning, this shaking. And he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now what's interesting about this as we make our way to 15 is Jesus is going to say to his disciples, he's going to validate their sincere belief in Yahweh. You believe in God. But that's not the issue. He's got to prepare them for something else. They believe in a vague sense of God, but he's got to convince them that they have to believe in the God of Jesus. It's not enough to believe in God. You've got to believe in Jesus. And you've got to believe in the God who allows his son to die. That's the difference. Do you believe in the God who's going to allow the Messiah to bleed out on a wooden beam at the hands of wicked men? So the question is not do you believe in God. Do you believe in the God who has arranged the messianic victory to come through the suffering? And that's what he's been trying to lead his disciples all the way up to the point that's going to come forth on the road to Emmaus. And when he shows up in the locked room, which is, did not the prophet say that Messiah had to what? Suffer before he what? Entered his glory. You believe in God? Awesome. Do you believe in the God who has arranged for my suffering? Do you believe in me? That becomes the question. And we know this was the stumbling block for Saul of Tarsus. When Jesus shows up, he speaks to Paul, or Saul at that time, and what is he going to say? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? At that moment, he burst Paul's 
triumphalism. And he introduces him to the right concept that Messiah has to suffer before he enters his glory like Moses would have to suffer, like David would have to suffer, like Joseph would have to suffer, like Daniel would have to suffer before he enters his glory. And so Jesus is saying, hey, you believe in God. But do you believe in the God of Jesus even when that belief involves has an unjust trial by night and a cruel Roman cross? Do you believe in that God? Their view of God was about to be challenged. Their triumphalism was about to be challenged. It's one thing to believe in God when everything is prosperous. It's quite another to believe in God when the promises look dead and the Messiah hangs limp between two thieves. Do you believe in God now? That's a question we have to answer. Do we have a view of God that allows for the crucifixion of his beloved son and then mandates the crucifixion of us? Do we believe in that God? Jesus prepares his disciples for this and he's going to say, hey, the time of trouble when Jesus is the least visible is the time to trust Jesus like never before. You believe in God, believe also in me. He said, hey, I'm going to be dead. And when I'm dead, I want you guys to trust me like never before. How many of you have been in that season when Jesus looks dead? And he says, trust me. (laughs) Young people, if you haven't lived long enough to, to have that, there is good news. You shall. You shall. There's time for you. But the time of trouble when Jesus is the least visible is the time to trust him like never before. And why do I say that? Because most of us in this room, by the design of God, will go through two or three bone-crushing, earth-rattling trials, crisis where everything we ever thought looks questioned and dead. And unless you know the right expectation, you, you don't, you, you start binding the enemy, rebuking the devil, and then you realize, oh, oh, you put that cross there. Is the devil involved? Yeah, yeah, sure. He's involved in every... All, I mean, he's just a... I just wish he was lazy, but he's not. He's always roaming around looking for who he can devour. But the question is, who sovereignly arranged it? Jesus reminds us in these times, let your, heart, let your hearts not be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And that's the point when Jesus is most absent, seemingly most absent, and the tempter whispers in your ear to give up. It's the time to trust him like never before. You believe in God, believe in me. And then in chapter 14, Jesus is going to talk about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And he's going to make this one statement before chapter 15. He says in verse 30, I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. He has nothing in me. In other words, the suffering, the crushing that Jesus is about to enter isn't because of his need for sanctification. It's the sovereign doing of the Father. But look at this. Jesus, I love he says this, and he has nothing in me. The ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me a commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. But there's a subtle inference here, which is the ruler of this world is coming. He has nothing in me, but you, on the other hand, (laughs) he's got some things in y'all. 
And it's going to be a rough three days. As God allows the fault lines to be revealed in Jesus' leadership team over the next three days in a very intense way. And that kicks off, so Jesus is going to have to introduce them to the new concept, which is abiding. And what is at the center of abiding is pruning. So let's look at it. Um, How do we, I'm going to lay some foundations that will prepare us for how to cooperate with the season next Sunday. But you first have to ask the question, how do you recognize when you're in a season of pruning? How many of you, you get into the, season where you're suffering and you go, wait a minute, is this because of my sin? Is this the rage of Satan? Is it because of y'all's sin? Because there's a corporate reality? You can be just fine, but you with us and us got issues. So there's, we don't like that part of family and community, but it's true. That if God is doing a global work or a national work, I mean, you, you know what? You can be, what, what was that, what's that guy's name? What is that guy's name? Oh, oh, Jabez prayer. You remember the Jabez prayer? That God will extend his influence and prosper him? But how many of you know if you are Jabez and you're living in Gideon's day, God might be blessing you, but the whole nation's hiding out in caves. So who cares if your cave is a little bigger than my cave? We're under oppression. My point is, is there are corporate realities that we all get swept up in. And, and the Lord can be moving in an hour of discipline, and you're over here going, pray in the Jabez prayer. Bless me more, God, bigger. And I've heard that most of my life. I never hear prayer meetings where you ask the Lord to release pruning in your life. (laughs) It's usually more. Give me more influence, more power, more money, more, 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 more. I hear, I hardly hear anybody go, less. God, just release less. Take away what I got. (laughs) My point is that Our our fragile human psyches don't embrace seasons of suffering, so we don't even know how to enter into it. We usually find ourselves in the middle of it, and if you're like me, I don't know whether it's Satan, I don't know whether it's corporate sin, I don't know whether it's my sin unless he points it out and I have understanding, or is it the rage of Satan? And I usually find myself rebuking Satan, repenting, and asking for the Lord to give me grace to, co- I, I mean, I just start covering all my bases. I don't know what y'all do. I was like, I'm blocking here. I'm asking for blessing here. I'm telling y'all to get right there as I search my own heart here. And so when you find yourself, you're just discombobulated, sometimes disillusioned, and you don't know how. <laughs> To really navigate what season you're in. But the first part is to understand the season is real of pruning. You know, Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8 says that though he was a son, Jesus learned obedience by the things which he suffered. That's the part of the Father Heart of God message we don't talk about. Have you ever heard my beloved identity, I suffer that I can learn obedience? I hardly hear anyone talking about the Father's heart and sonship or our message of our beloved identity with suffering involved. And yet, it's, Hebrews tells us it's a crucial part of growing in our obedience as children of God. In fact, part of Jesus' sonship was to learn that through suffering. In fact, it's vital to our identity as sons and daughters of God. It's the testing ground of our progeny or of our new birth. It's the evidence for his kids. How many of you know that you don't discipline other people's kids? Don't do it. Don't do it. Mama bear will come out if you try to discipline somebody else's kid. In fact, it's the evidence you're my kid if I discipline you. It's the very evidence of my beloved identity 
that my parents disciplined me. It was my privilege because other people don't. So it's your privilege of your new birth that the father treats you like a son or a daughter. The moment your discipline is not in your life is the moment you got to question, what's up? What's up? Am I his kid? Really? Say this name with me, St. Alphonsus. Okay, St. Alphonsus Liguori has a great uh, quote by St. Augustine. I just want to read it about the issue of suffering. He said, the same miseries send some to heaven and others to hell. The test of suffering separates the weak from the chaff in the church of God. Those who in times of tribulation humble themselves to the will of God are weak for paradise. And those who grow haughty and enraged and so forsake God are chaff for hell. The coming trouble, however, would reveal the fault lines and the deep character issues in the disciples' hearts. And in that moment of pruning, Jesus instructs them on the necessity of abiding in him. That he's the vine, we are the branches, and the father is the vine dresser and he prunes every branch so that it might bear more fruit. And he says, abide in the vine. Stay in the vine. Just as the life of the branch is contained in the vine, so too the life of a believer is found in Jesus. You know, it's the kindness of the gardener to lop off diseased parts of the branch. It's the kindness of the gardener. So then how do you recognize if you're in a season of pruning? And I want to offer you, I think, the single greatest way to tell if you're in a season of pruning is to identify the primary indicator, which is the suffering of loss. Nobody goes by a tree that's pruned and wonders whether that tree's been pruned. If you go by a tree that's been pruned, you go, oh, it lost, it's lopped off here. It's lost there, it's lost here, it's lost there, it's loss. The season of pruning is designed for loss. As a matter of fact, it's uh, the loss of finances, possessions, impact, influence, position, stature, relationship, opportunity. In fact, whatever was the basis of your reputation is usually removed. <laughs> to be pruned is to lose the basis upon which everyone around you measures you as successful. <laughs> That's why it's so horrible. If you've been through a season of pruning where God's told you to lay down everything or God forced you to lay down everything or that, uh, whether it was voluntary or involuntary, you lost everything. And all your relatives and friends are going, they must not have the blessing of the Lord. <laughs> they must have done something wrong. And you find out all Job's friends are in every generation. That's why you got to be, the, the lesson of Job is, hey, when your friends are going through something, be nice. Be nice. Be nice. Because they could be in a pruning season and you didn't recognize it. And instead you were, mm, mm-hmm. But it's the basis by which everyone else measures you as successful is removed. And it's one of the worst feelings in the world to go through. To lose your business. To lose your ministry. To lose your house. Mercy. To lose your reputation. And it's in that moment that the process of loss on multiple fronts produces weariness, fear, despair, tiredness, disillusionment, 
and you find yourself in that place, like Peter, weeping bitterly. And it's usually the loss of the promises. The promises look dead. Well, it's in that point, that vulnerable moment of the pruning of the loss, the tempter comes and says, see, 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 told you not to do that, told you not to follow him, told you not to get your hopes up. In fact, now it begins to assault. It's that, it's that tempter that comes like in the wilderness, if you were a son. If you were a daughter, you wouldn't be here. You should have never done this anyway. You should have listened to your parents. You should have listened to your friends. You should have listened to everyone else that told you not to do that. You shouldn't have followed that voice that you thought was God. Have you ever heard that voice? You're a loser. You're a failure. You can't get anything right. God's disappointed in you. How can he use you if you're like this? And in the midst of the pruning, the fault lines of your weaknesses and deficiencies are just out there. You know how hard it is to say it's God when all your junk's out there like this? No, you did that. That's what the enemy goes, no, you did that. And the Lord goes, no, that's you, but I did that so that you could see you and everybody else could see you. And then we could come in agreement on you so we can make it about me. Because it wasn't dependent on you anyway. That's the point. And it's at that point the tempter goes, go back to your old life. And the temptation is to retreat into nice, safe, controllable boundaries. Have you ever been in the pruning and 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 because you stepped out and then you enter the pruning season and the tempter goes, hey, why don't you just go back to that? It was safe when you did that. It wasn't that hard when you did that. You could do this. <laughs> You're like, ah! At that moment, in the loss of everything, now we grasp at anything to get a little control of our boundaries. Reel it in. Reel that sucker in. Get control. Feel good about ourselves here. Because here we don't feel so good. So we go here. Am I, am I the only one? Do we have any, do we have any saints in here? <laughs> but here's the good news. After the resurrection, can you imagine how the tempter spoke to Peter before the resurrection? You thought you were the rock. You thought you were his voice piece. You thought you were an apostle. You're nobody. Nobody. Nobody even knows your name. You would be a laughing stock. But after the resurrection, he becomes the first voice piece of Jesus. Did you catch that? The point is, when the tempter comes and whispers those things, God's statement is always the opposite. No, I got you. You are the voice piece. I'm going to use you. And it's at that moment that the testing of our faith actually proves our genuineness before God and not our disingenuousness. That's why Peter said in this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having you have not seen, you love him. Peter goes, I've been through this, people. This is actually the evidence of your belovedness. 
It's not the evidence of your failure. It's the evidence of your success that you're in the trial. So therefore rejoice. And then James comes along and goes, Hey, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into various trials. I mean, the language there is so good, you fall into various trials. How many of you know you never just enter gracefully into trials? Yeah, going into a new trial. Thought I'd get a new suit. No, you fall into new trials. And James goes, hey, it'll train you. It'll perfect you. The writer of Hebrews says it'll perfect you in holiness to those who've been trained by it. Paul will say, don't grow weary in doing good. It's through many tribulations you're going to enter the kingdom. This is the way of God. I feel like we've told a whole generation it's just glory to glory, success to success, and we've never taught them about the seasons and rhythms of life when the Lord comes and he has a different face than what you were expecting. And we've got to train them better. (laughs) And we've got to endure it better so we can train them better and learn its ways In the letter to Hebrews, the writer says, do not draw back in that day of trial. Let it do its good work. See, going back to the comfort of a risk-free life is not an option. Thus, the pruning season demands refocus without retreat. I find a lot of people draw back in their faith of what they're believing God for in the pruning season. I would say to you, be very careful, Christian. The evil one comes in the weak state of the pruning process to confuse and derail us by having us reinterpret the previous season. In our season of loss, the father of lies whispers to us. But I want to tell you, nothing derails, well, I shouldn't say that. Few things derail us more than a wrongly interpreted previous season. See, when the pruning starts, when the trouble hits, the tempter comes and says, see, that last season when you thought you were doing well wasn't so hot, was it? And now we look back on that season with a tainted view. And he tries to get you to reinterpret your last season as fruitless so he can rob the hope that you'll have fruit in the next season. That's what he does. He comes with, gets that witchcraft in your eyes. And he tells you, he goes, hey, your last season, you wasted it. And your future season is nothing. Instead of it's the good father who's revealing your fault lines so that you can grow from glory to glory on the inside as he crucifies you before the world on the outside. That's his way. (laughs) You go, Alan, this isn't too encouraging. You're like, this isn't encouraging at all. (laughs) The football game was bad enough last night. This is double. Well, Satan attempts to steal the right interpretation of your last season. He wants you to interpret it as, as your season of loss as the result of your failure and the Lord's abandonment of you. Yet nothing is further from the truth. You're not being pruned because you failed, but because you're succeeding. He prunes the fruitful branches, people. You're succeeding. The good news is that more fruit is just around the corner. What's the fourfold purpose in pruning? You can do five, you can do six. I chose four that are in this text, but I'm telling you, listen to Wes's sermon of those five principles he gave on Friday. The fourfold purpose. When we look at this, John 15, 1, verses 1 to 8, we have to understand something. Suffering is both the context and the fruit of a fallen world. I don't know how many believers I know, they, they get saved, they just think the world changed. And yet everybody suffers. Everybody. You're not unique because you're a believer. Buddhists suffer. Muslims suffer. Atheists suffer. Satanists suffer, probably the worst. He treats his servants the worst. 
everybody suffers. The good news is it only, it only works on behalf of believers. <laughs> I mean, amazing. Imagine everybody, the world, the context is suffering. The fruit of a fallen world is suffering. And Jesus goes, you know what? i got great kindness for you who to believe. I'm going to use the worst things of this world on your behalf. It'll count for you. Can you imagine for an unbeliever, suffering doesn't count. It might adjust their, their responses a little bit better in this age, but they go from one degree of suffering in this life to eternal suffering. But for a believer, all things work together for good to them that know the Lord and are called according to his birth. You know what a kindness that is for you? That in the, you are already suffering even if today you went, I don't like the God who lets me suffer. And you go, no, I walk away. You're still going to suffer. Tomorrow's going to be worse. That's the world you're in. But the Lord goes, in the context of a fallen world, I will use even the worst thing of this life, suffering, for your blessing. And I'd said this before, but you know, you only get one chance to love God in the suffering. You only got a short window of 70 to 80 years. For all eternity, you're going to love him in the blessing. No more tears, no more crying, no more pain, no more confusion, no more loneliness, no more isolation, no more being misunderstood, no more uh, breaking of relationship, no more loss, no more, no more, no more, no more. For all eternity, and you got this little sliver called 70 to 80 years to love him when everybody else does it. And you, do, you know what an invitation that is. That in the midst of the suffering, you get to love him. Most people go, I don't know if I'm going to love him in the midst of the suffering, but the truth is you get to. And if you do, it works on your behalf to bring forth the fruit of godliness. And then God counts it for all eternity. What kind of God allows you to love him in the context of suffering and then pays you for it for the rest of eternity? And goes, you gave me that little reach there and I met you there and worked it for good in this life and paid you back a hundredfold in the next life. Oh my gosh. When you think of it that way, you're like, man, I didn't know what I was doing. I got disillusioned. I lost everything, but I said yes to you in the little reach. Counted. And the Lord goes, yeah, it does. Even a glass of cold water counted for you. Every time you resisted temptation, it counted for you. Every time you said, I love you, and yet you were weeping and didn't understand your context, I counted it for you. See, I, I, I feel like we just need to switch from mean God good us to life is hard and great God who uses all things for our good and his glory and for the redemption of the world. What does it look like for somebody to actually die well today? We don't talk about that. Die well. You know it's appointed unto man to die. There's one thing that has been appointed for you for sure. To die. And then give account to God. And I have gray hair, 54 years of age, and I'm going to blink in my life. 20 will be gone, and I will be closer to that day than I know. I, I, think, there's a, I think there's a time coming when, when do the saints, when do funerals become, you know, when the saints go marching in, and the casket's going, and the... And the trumpets blaring and we're doing the you hear what I'm saying anybody been to New Orleans we got to get back some of that right when I look over Jordan and what do I see coming for to carry me home band of pretty angels coming after me coming for to carry me home Swing low, sweet chariot. We don't even think that way anymore. We're like pissed at God if we get sick. (laughs) 
our girlfriend breaks up with us. No, you've been appointed to die. Where are the saints that face it and sing through it? Look it in the eye and go, I've got to get delivered of that so I can be worth my salt in this life. So I can conform to the refiner's fire and be purged of everything that hinders love. God unfolds a little season of loss. I deserve more than this. No, you deserve nothing. And God's given you everything so that even though you die, yet shall you live. And those who believe in him will never die. We got to get some old school religion in us again. Why did all the old time saints have old time revival? They were living in old time thoughts. Oh, well. We don't have time. We'll pick it back up next week. I just feel this in my spirit. I feel this in my spirit. Can I be happy in God, joyous in God, in season, out of season, pruned, not pruned, prosper? Can I, can I? Fire. I just want that fire of the Holy Spirit. Fire of the Holy Spirit to purge, to cleanse, to sanctify, to renew my mind. Jesus. Hallelujah. We'll close. I if you're just, I just feel like today is like, can we, can we flip the switch? Can we change the perspective? What's that book from prison to praise? Have you ever read that book, Prison to Praise? When you're in prison to praise, do you know how to thank God in the season of pruning? Do you know how to abide in the vine? To give thanks in all things, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. To give thanks in all things, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. I wonder, I just wonder, why am I saying it? Because I think corporately this morning I was praying. I sent, I felt like the Lord gave me a word. I sent it to some of, uh, some people and just for them to weigh it actually. Because, you know. Just because I had it don't mean it's true. I want my brethren to weigh it and speak into it. But I, I felt the gentle movings of the Holy Spirit just whisper, Alan, I, I'm about to come visit you all. And there was this sense of we're living in a time where the Lord is bringing us all into a corporate pruning and discipline. If you've got a pulse and you love Jesus, Welcome to the party. He's about to refine you for the coming trouble. He's going to get you ready. He's a good leader. He's going to sanctify us. And so I felt like in that context of corporate discipline, his smile down upon us. I felt like the last year, it's like he just reconvened the family from the four winds of the earth. People just, just, And as he convened them, every kind of opportunity for misunderstanding, conflict, personal trial, it's just like like he just drew us to the wilderness. He just said, I'm going to just shake, I'm going to do the work of kindness right off the bat. I'm just going to get in there and start doing this stuff. (laughs) And then throw in national crisis and... Just everything. Just tons of stuff. 
And all of you have a different story of how he did that. And basically, the Spirit invited you. The Lord said, draw away, my love. Come away. Come to me. And he invited you into the abiding process. And we'll talk about that next week. But in that place, the Lord began to do a deep work in your heart as you had to draw near him to where he, was, he alone was your identity. The loss. The loss of tons of stuff. And that weighed on us. And yet at the same time, the Lord was going, come. And I felt his pleasure that he had allured us to the wilderness to speak tenderly to us. And that that deep work over the last year of exercising that muscle of, I trust you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Help me see people rightly. Help me do what you... Just all those little prayers of, how did I get here? And why am I here? And is this right? And is this this and this and this? All those questions of in that abiding with him and letting the word move in you, that the Lord was pleased. I felt like he was going to release a new grace. Uh, called joy and peace as we discover each other and that there would be a new expression of, uh, how, did I, how did I call it, of mutual joy and peace as we had this ease in being able to meet each other, to see each other, and that the graces and gifts of God to work together, he would begin to help us and we would be able to it, the ease of it would be the evidence of the hard work of a year. And I just felt that coming, his sweetness. And that all these different people from everywhere, the Lord goes, I'm going to help you. But I'm going to help you so well. I'm so good in my leadership. I'm going to bring you here and just shake you up. Just shake you. Just let all kinds of collisions and trials happen. So that I become your source. And I felt his tenderness over us. It was like, it was just a little, good job. Just a little, hey, hey, you're right on time. You're just right on time. It's my good leadership to do this for you. So anyway, I, I just offer that to you. But I feel like he's with us. And I feel like he's going to continue to come to us. The evidence of his presence with healing, with salvation with deliverance, and that he's building the people of God. So anyway, so I just offer that to you. If you go, you know what? I just want to set my heart before the Lord to trust him in this season. Let me, I'll say it this way. If you've been in a season of trial and you've experienced loss, some things you've lost that define you as successful in what you do and who you are. If that's you, I just want you to stand where you're at. So I just know. I go, I'm, I'm, I'm with the right folks. You, you've experienced loss. <laughs> just a few of you people. 